Uh, welcome to the March edition of Last Month in Criminal Justice. Um, I'm Richard Garside, the Director of the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies, and I'm going to be hosting this morning's discussion. I'm going to be joined by an excellent panel, and I'll mention them in a minute. We've, we've got, a, I think, a really interesting uh, group of issues to discuss today. Uh, we're going to be talking in a bit about the campaign against joint enterprise convictions. You're one of the most conspicuous injustices of the current justice system. We're going to be talking about latest prison developments, uh, including plans to build even more prison places, another 4,000 prison places on the way. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, something which has maybe not got as much coverage as it should have done, the, the um, private prosecution scandal involving hundreds of post office workers who were wrongly prosecuted and in many cases imprisoned um, after being accused of defrauding the post office and um, they're entirely innocent and it's a big scandal and a public inquiry has just started looking into that. So we're going to be discussing that. We're going to be talking about the uh, prosecution of rape and sexual assault. So it was something that we touched on in the previous um, edition of this programme and we want to go back to it again today. There's been a new report out. We're going to be asking, I think one of the hot button issues, should misogyny be treated as a hate crime. Um, really strong differences of opinion on that and some very kind of principled positions both for and against it and I'm really looking forward to that discussion. Uh, and first we're going to be kicking off with a discussion about the crisis in the Metropolitan Police, biggest crisis ever. It's really difficult to tell, there have been so many, but we're going to be talking about that. And to, to help me and, and you make sense of all of these um, issues, uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Charlotte Henry, a, a lawyer and a campaigner for Jengba, uh, which is Joint Enterprise Not Guilty by Association, uh, by Whitney Isles, uh, Chief Executive of Project 507. Uh, some of you may remember Whitney was our lunch with um, guest in January and we enjoyed her contribution so much we invited her back to last month in Criminal Justice. And, uh, and also Roger Grimshaw, my colleague and research director at the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies, uh, in place of Tim Newburn, who unfortunately couldn't make it because of uh, the university's strike action, which I'm sure, uh, you know, we're all very supportive of uh, as, the, as university lecturers fight for uh, their pension rights. So Tim very sadly couldn't join us today, but I'm delighted that Roger was able to step into the fray at short notice uh, to join me. So... Um, Roger, Char um, Charlotte and Whitney, if you'd like to join me and then we will uh, we will make a start uh, on uh, the first item, uh, which is a uh, crisis in the Metropolitan Police. As we've discussed in earlier editions of last month, the criminal justice, the Metropolitan Police is in something of a crisis with racism, misogyny and gross misconduct making the headlines regularly. Uh, this month, the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, Cressida Dick, resigned after the London Mayor, Sadiq Khan, made it clear that he did not have confidence in her leadership. He denies forcing her out and that itself has created a whole new row. Um, so let's just um, start straight away. Roger, I mean, is, you've, you've followed policing developments for many, many years. I mean, is, has the Metropolitan Police ever been in such a state? Is this the worst crisis they've ever been in? A good question, Richard. Uh, I would answer, by saying I think it's the most contemporary of crises and they're not new. Um, I mean, you can look back, uh, for example, to the problems addressed by Robert Mark when he became commissioner, um, systematic corruption, uh, payoffs by criminals in, you know, in the CID. We look back to the Macpherson inquiry um, into the murder of Stephen Lawrence, which described what it found as institutional racism. And there's this long history of discord, uh, you know, uh, between black communities and the police. What is new um, is the convergence of issues around a range of equalities, um, which are of concern, I think, not only to agencies, but to, to, to the general public. And um, you know, I, I, I can briefly refer to some of the most prominent recently, such as the pro policing of protests after the murder of um, Sarah Everard by a serving police officer, um, the failures, um, which are pretty well known now, and to the uh, failures of the investigation of murders by, uh, by Stephen Port of gay men. And then um, what seems to have kind of clinched the 
perception of the problem with the uncovering of hostile and derogatory language um, and messages at Charing Cross Police Station. Um, and there was also the, um, you know, the, the notorious selfies um, of the bodies of Bieber Henry and Nicole Smallman. And, uh, you know, this all kind of led, I was really struck, um, um, Sadiq Khan gave an interview um, on BBC Radio, just actually, I think it was the day before um, Cressida Dick resigned. And he said, and I thought it was such a striking um, observation he made, I'd be really interested in, uh, you know, in Whitney or Charlotte, if you have any thoughts on this. He told Radio 4 that, quote, the sexist, misogynist, sorry, the, the racist, sexist and misogynistic and unprofessional behaviour in the Met is a more profound problem than those considered by the McPherson inquiry into institutional racism. You know, that was the inquiry into the, well, let's be polite, failings of the investigation to Stephen Lawrence's murder. And I was really struck that he made that, and he would have known what he was doing. He would have known what he was doing by making the comparison with, Ferg with McPherson and saying, it's even worse than that. And um, I, you know, I thought that was a really kind of quite a striking intervention. I don't know, um, Whitney or Charlotte, whether we're putting them on the spot here, whether you have any thoughts on, on that particular intervention by Sadiq Khan, um, or indeed um, anything that Roger's just said? Um, yeah, so I have a view not on the misogyny element. I've not researched into the police and, and in particular misogyny, and I've not experienced it as a criminal defence lawyer either. Um, but when it comes to racism, I've had a number of cases where the police have stopped um, black people, those were my clients, they were black, um, without reasonable grounds for suspecting them of committing an offence. And then when the, um, the young person opposed the arrest, it's called obstructing, even though it's a unlawful arrest, um, serious violence was used against them. So I have um, seen that firsthand with my clients. And also when I've gone into police stations to represent clients, I've seen the way police officers interact with each other. So one of the police stations that I um, attended before was Acton Town and the way that the custody sergeant there and even the nurse, the medical practitioner spoke to officers, it was humiliating for them. So you, you can see through that chain of command, the way officers are treating officers and way, what the way officers then treat my clients. Um, so yeah. That's kind of really interesting because I mean, it kind of touches on that sort of, I suppose, that notion of organisation theory of toxic cycles, mm. you know, where, you know, sort of nobody and everybody is kind of engaged in a sort of a process of kicking down, as it were, and of kind of, you know, abusing each other along the chain of command, um, you know. Yeah, and, you know, absolutely. Fascinating. Um, I mean... I guess this sort of raises, I mean, there, there's been a you know, big issue now about kind of tension between the Home Secretary and the Mayor of London. The Home Secretary ultimately has a responsibility for appointing a new commissioner, but Sadiq Khan's made it very clear that he's not prepared to work with anybody who he doesn't have confidence in at all. And, you know, reminds me a bit of the, um, you know, the arguments um, between a former uh, Mayor of London, a certain Boris Johnson, who effectively forced out an earlier um, commissioner of the Met uh, in not dissimilar circumstances. I mean, it was it was for different reasons, but you know, and the, the Home Secretary at the time, um, Jackie Smith, was reportedly furious about that. Um, but it also raises, I think, wider questions of police legitimacy, you know, and the degree to which what it actually means for the police to be accountable to the communities they claim to police and. Uh, Roger, I mean, you've kind of literally written the book on this, um, as well as thought quite a lot about these issues. Uh, you know, is it, I mean, leaving aside whether the Metropolitan Police can ever come, you know, can come back from this and over what time scale, is there just a fundamental systemic problem here with the way that police forces relate to the populations that they claim to represent and police and protect? And what can we do about that if that is the case? Oh, you're, you're muted, Roger. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, I think the issue of legitimacy uh, relates to what Charlotte was saying about the, the type of conduct that, that is generated within policing 
Um, and what becomes clear is that it, we've seen this it very inward and very self-regarding police culture. And it's not simply as you, it's not simply about um, the canteen. Um, it actually is infused throughout the police structure um, because all officers learn practically on the job. And I think also we ought to be aware of the huge ar array of legal powers given to constables, um, which is like giving your, your junior assistants your, your most complicated tools. And I think that the, the most important thing to say about this is that unless the job requires them to listen and respect communities, they won't, they won't um, develop what we're looking for um, because they get used to simply exercising power. And some would argue, for example, the death of neighborhood policing has designed out that input because, because police officers are not obliged to go out and talk to, to people. And unless they learn the consequences of, of their own actions, um, they, they won't adapt to communities. And I think often that's, I think that's, it's not about the case, you know, it's not about having loads of consultants who come in and say, oh yeah, this is, this is a much more friendly way of policing. It, it has to be um, embedded in the design of the job and in the forms of supervision. I mean, wasn't the, uh, I mean, wasn't the whole point of, oh, I'm sorry, Whitney, you were going to say something. I, I just wanted to add, because I'm um, kind of listening to what Roger's saying, it's the relational aspect of the, the police is missing. But can you actually have clean relationships when the kind of policing as an institution is around a power imbalance, because it's around the enforcement of laws and policies. So you can have a really kind of a uh, good well-meaning officer kind of within the the organization but it's not necessarily about the individual it's about what it represents in the institution and you know I think what we've been doing a lot more as a society is thinking about kind of what does anti-oppressive practice look like and kind of really true relational practice and can we have good relationships if the starting point is a power imbalance What's what's your answer to that question? As it were, particularly in relation to the police, I guess. I don't think we can. I think we we set up everyone up for this kind of impossible task, including the police officers. Of you know how you know is there a way to police communities if they you're coming in with a power imbalance, and not just from the the police, but from society as a whole, because we see kind of racism and oppression across the board. It's, and, and the police are there to kind of enforce a lot of, of the, the structures that society has been developed on. And actually, you know, we can talk about the police until we're, we're blue in the face and who's going to kind of take over, um, you know, certain positions. But actually, the institution itself is flawed. But the institution itself is flawed because of society's flaws and how society has been designed. And actually, the fact that society is completely unequal and oppressive, and there needs to be a lot of kind of systemic change at these kind of MP levels and, and parliament and, and policy and there's so many things that need to change I think we can also get quite distracted um, debating and, and conversing about what the police need to do. Thank you it's really interesting it's kind of police is sort of almost kind of an expression of this is the society they operate in isn't it really and the kind of with all its dysfunctions and antagonisms. Um, that was a really interesting discussion. I'm sure we'll return to it, but we do need to move on at this point to the next item. Um, I should have mentioned at the beginning, and that's entirely my fault, we do have a Q&A function. Uh, so if you want to pose a question or indeed just make a comment or an observation uh, via the Q&A function, uh, you'll find it at the bottom or the top of your Zoom app, depending on whether you're using Microsoft or Apple, I don't really understand these things, but that's what I've been told to say. So um, it says Q&A, and if you click on that, you can post a question. You can also upvote. If you particularly like a question, you can upvote it, and um, it's more likely to get picked up and answered. Uh, but let's move on now to the next item on joint enterprise. Um, under the rules of joint enterprise, multiple individuals can be prosecuted for a single offence there have been some conspicuous injustices, including the brother of one of today's panellists, Charlotte Henry. 
In 2016, the Supreme Court ruled that joint enterprise rules had been wrongly interpreted for three decades, yet thousands remain languishing in prison. Uh, research by the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies that we'll be publishing in April also suggests that the Supreme Court ruling appears to have had very little, if any, impact on, uh, on the likelihood or the numbers of joint enterprise convictions or pr prosecutions, rather, and this despite the ruling that the law had been wrongly applied. Uh, so it's a really important issue uh, that has been over a number of years now, um, the organisation that Charlotte is part of, Jengba, has been running an extraordinary and really impressive campaign to try and raise attention to this really dreadful situation. Um, Charlotte, uh, just tell us a little bit about your brother Alex's case, because it's, it's a real shocker, I think. Oh, and you're muted. We'll get, you'll get used to this. This always happens at the beginning of programs. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was the 6th of August, 2013, and uh, my brother was out shopping with three friends in Ealing Broadway. He came out of a shop with one of those friends to see another one of his friends um, being circled by a group of four older men. He knew, um, well, he feared for his friend's safety because his friend was holding a wine bottle um, by his side, which clearly he had just taken from a local shop. And he was brandishing it as a weapon. Um, and two of the opposing group had taken off their belts and wrapped them around their fists or were kind of lassoing, slashing them, uh, uh, to also use as a weapon. So he knew something um, could happen. He ran into his friend's defence, and as he runs in, the violence erupts around him. He notices Janelle's phone on the floor. He picks that up and he throws that at one of the boys. He sees that um, another boy punch Janelle, so he then punches that boy. Um, and there's violence on both sides. It, it was instigated, what we found out later, by the victim's group. And the violence lasted only 47 seconds. But during that time frame, the boy that my brother came out of a shop with used a concealed knife to stab two people. And one of those people, Taki Kaziki, tragically died at the scene. Um, but gro both groups were strangers. There was no prior motive. They couldn't use the gang rhetoric that the prosecution often employ in these cases. And it really was a case of being at the wrong place at the wrong time. And he's currently in prison. And what, what was the length of his sentence? And when, I mean, you've, you, your, your story itself, I mean, your personal story is, I think, quite inspiring because it was one of the, one of the main reasons why you decided to become a lawyer. Yes. Know, to, so when is, I mean, if if the if the just the normal run of things happen, when when is he likely to be released? Do you think? So the trial took place in March two thousand and fourteen, and it was a six week trial. He was convicted, and he was sentenced to nineteen years imprisonment. He has to serve. It's a mandatory minimum sentence. So it was a life sentence with a mandatory minimum term of nineteen years. So he has to serve every single one of those years and only then can he apply for parole, um, which has its own pitfalls as well. You often don't get parole first time. Uh, so he will be 40 something uh, at the earliest point that he'll be released. And you and your mother, Sally, I mean, there's a really moving video. Uh, we, we actually put it on the page of this for this programme uh, and we'll share it with uh, with with everyone who attended today, and I mean, it's a really, it's a really difficult video to watch actually, because it just kind of feels such a, you know, I mean, it's such a kind of Orwellian situation to be in, and I mean, it must, I, I can only imagine how difficult it must be for, for you know, for you, for you and your wider family to to be wrestling and challenging this. Yeah, it's been um, it's been a very difficult time. Um, when other things happen in life, you. You have the moment that it happens and then you have the point where you begin to recover and, and get over it. But this is, you know, he's still in prison. It's still an injustice. I can't get over it. Um, so it's just keeping, keeping something to fight for. Um, and as Gloria Morrison said, who's our campaign coordinator, she said, you must harness your anger um, into something positive, which is our private members bill at the moment.
And we'll come on to the private members bill in a second, because I think it's a really important development. But um, I think Whitney, you you had some thoughts on this you wanted to share? I am kind of particularly interested in joint enterprise. So I come at the idea from, you know, I want a peaceful society. I have worked on a horrific amount of homicide cases that involve children and under 25s. So kind of one aspect of my career is working over here. And then the other aspect of my career is, is working in the prison estate with um, majority young men that are in on violent offences. And I'm at the point where I want solutions so we're not having to deal with homicides in the first instance. And I know that there's a lot of kind of push for uh, kind of legislation like joint enterprise and, uh, and longer sentences as if it's going to create sustainable change and create peace. But it doesn't create peace. It creates this kind of notion of peace, um, negative peace. So you kind of uh, remove the violence or remove the violent people. But actually, it's not creating positive peace because positive peace is about putting things in place to kind of deal with the root causes and actually what I see is so much trauma that is being kind of embedded into communities now because of these sentences. So you have the, the trauma of the loss and the murder and the, the perpetrating the murder, you have the trauma of the life sentence, you have the trauma of people who are kind of uh, still maintaining their innocence and are innocent in a lot, a lot of ways in the, the prison estate. And then we also have, you know, many of the young men that I've worked with that are in on, on joint enterprise, especially those where you're looking at the cases and you're thinking, why are you, you serving 20, 30 years in prison? If you actually listen to kind of what they've been through, there is a lot of complex trauma in their, their childhood and complex trauma in, in kind of fundamental development years has an effect on cognitive functioning. And then we also think about kind of neurodiversity like autism and sensory processing. And I don't think any of these things, and there's so much of an overlap there as well. I don't think anyone's truly taken into consideration kind of what's going on for these young men and actually fight, flight or freeze. And some of the things kind of where they're at in their development. And these long sentences I, I don't believe are actually doing anything to better those people that are in the prison estate because after five years in prison, there's really very little that you can do to keep kind of kind of uh, developing yourself. You've done the majority of your, your programs, you know, uh, that you've done the majority of education. There's, there's very little you can do. So actually, there's a lot of arguments to say putting especially the under 25s in for such long sentences is not benefiting anyone and is not making them kind of uh, kind of civilians that can come out and be uh, kind of part of society it actually fragments it a lot more and I think we need to really change our lens to think about how do we create more peaceful societies where these violence incidents aren't happening in the first instance and that's kind of my focus when I think about these things. Thank you Whitney and um really really important sort of an interesting challenging observations and uh, uh, if you're interested more in, um, in in that whole kind of dimension then very much recommend the lunch with Whitney that we did back in January you can access it via our website and Whitney talks in a lot more detail about some of these issues and about some of the challenges of you know what it means to do meaningful work uh, for you know transformative change rather than just kind of as we're turning the wheel and keeping things moving along. Um, we did want to though come back um, to this matter of the private members bill um, that I think Charlotte you I mean you, you basically wrote the bill as well so I, I mean a kind of impressive accomplishment in itself but just tell us briefly about the bill and what it's you know trying to do and what the problem it's trying to address. So the time at the time that my brother was convicted, there existed um, two ways in which he could be convicted for someone else's crime. And in um, Jen Jenba, the campaign group, we campaigned for six years. And in the case of RV Jogi, one of those ways was abolished. And so now there's only one way in which he can be convicted for another's crime. And the difference between the two types of joint enterprise was stark. The law that convicted my brother he, was, um, he could have been convicted of murder on the basis that he foresaw the possibility that someone else might commit murder or cause um, the person serious bodily harm. 
Whereas now you have to intentionally participate in the murder by encouragement or assistance and know that the murder will take place in order to be convicted. Um, so it's a much kind of higher threshold currently. The law that convicted my brother also convicted like over a thousand people, Jenga supports over a thousand, um, although the statistics are unclear, um, but I, I would definitely say oh, well over a thousand people have, were convicted under the type of joint enterprise that was abolished. Um, but those people don't um, get an appeal, so they don't get fair retrials based on the change in the law. The reason is that if someone is appealing um, out of time, which is beyond 28 days following the date of conviction, and um, they're appealing based on a change in the law, they have to pass this, this test called the substantial injustice test. That was interpreted for us um, to mean that we have to prove we are innocent in order to have an appeal in the first instance. Um, so what the private members bill does is it abolishes that test uh, by amending the Criminal Appeal Act. So that's what we're trying to pass now in order to get everyone that was convicted under um, the joint enterprise that was abolished, fair appeals. And I think you have um, Andrew Mitchell, I think, amongst other MPs who's who are interested in trying to get this through the through the House of Commons. And it's certainly not impossible. I mean, private members' bills often don't go anywhere, but there have definitely been private members' bills that have gone all the way and have become become legislation. I think the, the what became known as Senny's Law, which is about mental health detention, I think, is an example of that where it started as a private members but I think by the um, now the Shadow Justice Secretary um, Steve Reid and, and has become law so we can only wish you the very best in getting that through and it's certainly I think joint enterprise is certainly something that we're working on and very supportive of Jengba. Um, our next lunch with event on the 16th of March we're going to be talking with uh, with Gloria Morrison and um, Jan Cunliffe, um, two of the founders of, of Jengba. Uh, and my colleague Helen Mills will be in discussion with them. So if you haven't registered for that and you want to know more about the work around um, challenging joint enterprise, I'd strongly recommend and encourage you to, uh, you know, to to register for that. I'd also strongly recommend you and encourage you to continue keeping those questions coming and or maybe get some questions coming. And we, we currently don't have any questions coming. And maybe that's just where we're answering all the questions that anybody listening and, and watching um, could possibly think to ask. But, if you have any questions um, on on the items that are coming up, we're not going to go backwards now, but any of the items coming up, uh, then um, then then please uh, put them in. And just to remind you of that, uh, we're going to go on in a minute to talk about prisons. And then after that, we're going to be talking about the post office private prosecution scandal. Uh, then we're going to be talking about the prosecution of rape. And then we're going to finish um, with the question of should misogyny be treated as a hate crime? There must be some people here who have some views on that. So do share those thoughts and we'll uh, we'll pick them up in the uh, in the discussion as we get to it. Let's move on to the next item now, just um, some recent developments in the prisons world and uh, a key one in particular. In February, uh, the Justice Secretary Dominic Raab announced plans to create 4,000 new prison places in England and Wales. And this is on top of the 20,000 places previously announced. Uh, now, if, if these all go ahead, that means we're going to have a prison population of over 100, or at least prison capacity, and I think where capacity goes, um, the population seems to follow, of 100,000 over the coming years. Uh, to place that in context, in 1974, the year that Mr Raab was born, the prison population stood at 38,000. So enormous, massive increase in numbers uh, over a number of years. Uh, now, Whitney Isles, one of our panellists today, um, has recently written a piece for our website, and she argues, and I quote, our prisons are there to uphold the status quo and enforce many of the oppressive and racist practices we are yet to dismantle and redesign. And she also criticises, uh, she and her co-authors, I hasten to add, not just Whitney, um, she and her co-authors also criticise uh, what they describe as performance activism, which amounts to very little change on the ground, though perhaps leaves many feeling good about their efforts. Um, Whitney, I mean, are we ever going to get out of this kind of monotonous and really damaging cycle of just endless prison growth, do you think? And if so, how on earth are we going to do it? I think we will get out of it when we have 
better informed leadership that are more politically brave and willing to do something to create sustainable change. Um, I'm reading some of the questions that are, are happening in the chat as well. And Wendy, yes, I do think it's a, a build it and they will come. And I think it will be very easy to go to 100,000 spaces to then you know, 120,000 spaces, and it will just continue to grow because this is this is an economic interest. This gives jobs. This provides, you know, people with salaries and pensions as well. So there's an economic interest in, in these things as well. And one of the things that I've always been interested in is, you know, follow the money, because when you follow the money, you tend to see kind of why political changes are being made in the first instance. And you know, when we kind of go back to how we started this conversation and speaking about the police and institutional racism, um, you know, what we will end up seeing is a bigger disproportionality of black and brown and um, kind of those who are minoritized due to their race, race and faith and, and gender. We'll, we'll just see kind of larger populations and, and that kind of larger increase in disproportionality. And I think you know, if we want to create a fairer society, we need to really be thinking about these things in a lot more depth because I am biased. So I work with the under 25s and I firmly believe we should not be sending children or in fact under 25s into prison. And I also work with violent offenders. So I understand the kind of how complex these issues are. But from being within the prison estate, I'm also seeing that they're not working. You know, it, it's not working and actually, what the prisons are doing are, are upholding a particular status quo. They're upholding the hierarchy. They're upholding the power imbalance. They're upholding the racism. They're upholding kind of so many things that are wrong within society. And actually, you know, there's real power in having these kind of intellectual conversations and finding alternatives and, and different solutions because at the end of the day, we're just going to keep building and keep building and keep building. But what are we actually doing? Are we creating more peaceful societies? And I think the kind of the main objective here is to create societies where people feel safe and people are safe and people can thrive and be happy. And if that's the ultimate goal, then prisons is not the way to do that. And there has to be some more kind of thought process and input into alternatives to that. I think we've seen um, things go right in the, the children's estate with the lowering of the numbers, but we've also kind of done that really well with white children, and we've also done that really well with non non-violent children. And I'm really interested in thinking about violence and thinking about how do we truly dismantle is, uh, systemic harm and violence and racism. And when we see the kind of the building of the new prisons, but then we see the, the white sentencing paper, which is also looking at putting children in prison for longer. It, it makes no sense to me if we're thinking about creating more peaceful communities, because all we're really doing is pushing for more children to be on these kind of longer sentences. And I've worked with children who've gone in at 11, 12, 13, and are not coming out until their 20s, or going in at 17, 18, 19, and not coming out until their 30s and 40s. And I think it is absolutely horrific that we do that to children in, in this day and age. And there's also, I mean, on a related matter, there was a, a piece of a paper that came up from the Prisons Inspectorate for England and Wales uh, just in February, where they pointed out that, you know, acutely mentally distressed women were still being sent to prison as a place of safety um was, was the way that it was phrased and uh, you know the, the note says nobody would agree that prisons are the right place to keep women who are acutely unwell and um on, on our website um joe phoenix has just recently penned an article where you know she's called for a massive investment in housing and education and drug and alcohol services and others as part of a plan to effectively abolish women's imprisonment, uh, but you know, as part of itself, a plan to, uh, you know, to do radical decarceration more generally. So I'm just kind of wondering whether, you know, I mean, those traditional prison reformist perspectives, I kind of wonder increasingly whether they're just completely out of kilter with where we actually are and the challenging we challenges we're facing in the society, and whether, you know, those who really want to see significant change and need to fundamentally rethink the way that they approach this issue and their demands and the way they organize maybe learning you know lessons from organizations like Jengbo, who've been very effective at kind of organizing on a very particular issue and a very important issue um i don't know whitney whether you have some 
thoughts on that and the challenge of what meaningful reform might look like? I am not sure we can do meaningful reform. And I think that that's a really um, hard thing to say and to, to get our heads around. But can we have better prisons if prisons are fundamentally harmful and, uh, and traumatising and the laws are racist and oppressive and uphold particular status quo? I think a lot around kind of, well, where do I want to put my energy and where where is the change that I want to see? And actually, if I only have so much energy and, and so much life to live, then to try and to reform and make better a harmful kind of institution isn't necessarily where I want to be spending my time. I want to be in the community. I want to be dealing with the root causes. I want to be looking at the systemic changes that kind of uh, decrease the generation of violence rather than looking at things that are increasing harm and violence. So I think I think we have to have some really difficult conversations around reform and what we we mean by that. And is is this like a, a spectrum that we can move up and down? Or is reform sitting on the fence and not making a decision? And is it you're either pro-prison or you're an abolitionist? Uh, these are a lot of the kind of conversations and the debates that I have within my team and that I'm kind of working through myself right now. Thank you. There's an um, anonymous attendee um, making the point about whether, you know, there needs to be more of a discussion about uh, cost effectiveness and about whether we need to have a debate about that and about what the prisons are costing us. Uh, there's also, um, you know, a kind of a pick up on this point about depenalisation of drugs and alcohol. We don't have time to address that right now, but we may well come back to it. And also a reminder that, and this is actually news in the last few days, uh, that the prison inspectorate in Scotland um, is actually proposing um, to the cabinet secretary um, that under 18 should be removed from prison custody. And so far, as um, the comment there says, soon it's been so far been met with support. So that's encouraging in Scotland and maybe where Scotland leads, um, uh, England and Wales and, and Northern Ireland might follow. Uh, let's move on to the next item, which is um, the private prosecution scandal involving the post office that, um, you know, many may not really have heard much about, uh, but there's a public inquiry that's just been launched into the pro wrongful private prosecution of over 700 post office sub, um, post office sub postmasters, that's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, under English law, any individual or organisation has a legal right to pursue private prosecutions, and many sub postmasters were wrongly accused of stealing funds as a result of a catastrophic IT failure that was just claiming that money was not there, that was there and, and so on and so forth. Uh, a number of them ended up losing their careers, um, going to prison. And the uh, one of the House of Commons committees has just recently called for urgent action to compensate uh, the sub postmasters wrongly prosecuted. It's an extraordinary situation. And I think it kind of raises some important questions about, you know, the never mind the rights and wrongs of this case, the, the, the rights and wrongs of individuals and organisations being effectively able to take the law into their own hands and pursue private prosecutions. Um, so Roger, um, you and I actually, just as, an, as a separate project, we've been doing a bit of work looking at the justice systems and the, this particular uh, scandal has been one of the case studies we've been looking at. So what are your thoughts really now on the, um, the whole issue about individuals and organisations uh, having the right to pursue private prosecutions. Absolutely, it's a it's a fascinating area, and um, it's been neglected. I mean, some will find it really surprising that an agency like like the Royal Mail can prosecute independently in its own interests. For example, in Scotland and some other jurisdictions, the public prosecutors have a monopoly of criminal prosecutions. Now, in England and Wales, um, there, there is some safeguard um, at the moment, um, which might have applied to the, to the post, uh, post office submasters, because defendants um, can ask um, the Director of Public Prosecutions to review a prosecution, but they may not know of that right. Um, but the fundamental question, which has been, I think, addressed in a Justice Committee report, is why wealthy agencies with these deep pockets should have better chances of carrying out private prosecutions than say the Lawrence family, whose private prosecution against men accused of their son's murder was a real turning point in their campaign for justice. 
So there is there's, there's a sort of inequality of means here, which which I think is is which we ought to consider. Um, and there are there are kind of I think there's going to be a um, a fundamental um, set of questions about our prosecution system as a whole um, and the extent to which uh, victims um, of, of crime um, can have their interest in prosecution uh, secured. So, for example, um, what's the role of the Victims Commissioner? Um, should they be doing more to support the right of public prosecution for ordinary people? Be um, the victim's right to review scheme um, enables some some uh, so, so, some means of questioning uh, the crowd prosecution services decisions. But should it be strengthened? Does it operate too late in the day? Um, should should public agencies be obliged to report cases to the public prosecutor for decisions? Um, so this is the real the, the the whole questions around inequalities. I think are really important when we look at the right of private prosecution. And if we're just picking up on at least one of those kind of quite important strands, and you mentioned the Lawrence family, and I guess you know in a sense that's the dilemma, isn't it? Because we can all think of cases where we think, well, actually, no, they shouldn't have the right to private prosecution, or you know, it's not fair if some major multinational company is effectively you know, kind of picking on individuals who don't have the means to uh, properly defend themselves. But on the other hand, you know, there's no doubt that the Lawrence family, which is built on a, you know, extraordinary campaign, you know, over many, many years, um, you know, by Doreen and Neville and, and, and those around them, uh, you know, if it hadn't been for those, some of those kind of private prosecution, pr you know, pressure, then maybe we would never have you know, got any kind of resolution to the case. There may well not have been the McPherson inquiry. There may not have been a fairly forensic review of the failings of the police, however, you know, kind of incomplete and unsatisfactory ultimately that's proven to be. So, um, you know, is there a risk if we went down the line of saying, well, basically the pro prosecution is a monopoly of the state, uh, that a kind of, as it were, you know, the state itself can isn't always interested in prosecuting cases that really do need to be pursued. Maybe that's a rhetorical question. It, it is a bit of a rhetorical <laughs> question. I, I, don't, I think the debate will go on. Um, you know, should the right to prosecute private prosecution be, be residual, um, as it were, in the last instance? Um, but I think what's just as important is to consider the role of public prosecutors, because, again, um, in a to defend public prosecutors, um, they, they also can have an important influence on, um, on, on the police. Uh, they can operate as a very important filter uh, in terms of the public interest. Um, and therefore, the balance of, you know, um, of, of interest in, 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 in public prosecution may be defended um, by, by public prosecutors, um, particularly kind of in, in influencing the police who under our system um, still have an enormous amount of, of discretion in, in terms of how they follow, follow the evidence. You're watching Last Month in Criminal Justice with me, Richard Glasside, and I'm joined today by Roger Grimshaw, Whitney Isles, and Charlotte Henry. Uh, in a minute or in about 10 minutes or so, we're going to be coming on to the question of whether misogyny should be a hate crime. There's a comment here in the chat. Um, does the very notion of hate crime divert attention away from what people do by concentrating on what they think? Interesting question, and maybe we can pick that up um, shortly. Uh, before we do so, let's um, just move on to another issue about prosecution. You know, if, if private prosecutions can sometimes be open to, um, well, I don't really want to call it abuse or just kind of maybe some inappropriate actions against individuals. Um, the state isn't always very good at prosecuting either. And, uh, you know, the prosecution of sexual assaults and rape is a, is a, good, is a good example of that. We discussed um, this issue in the last edition of last month in criminal justice, um, particularly looking at the very low rates of prosecution of sexual offences. Uh, and since then, two criminal justice inspectorates um, for the police and for the Crown Prosecution Service 
have published a report. And in that, they state that the criminal justice system's failing victims of rape and widespread reform is needed to build trust and secure justice. And the report points out that it took an average of nearly 706 days between reporting an offence to the police and the start of a criminal trial. Uh, and they also noted that rape survivors face repeated delays and cancellations. I don't think anybody um, would disagree that rape prosecutions have been falling for some years, but um, they've never been particularly high. And I suppose one of the questions that comes from that is, you know, is, the, is it a problem of prosecution? Is that where the problem lies? Is it a wider problem of policing more generally? Or is it a wider problem still of, of a society of, of male entitlement and, um, and sexual violence? Um, big questions. Uh, Whitney, um, do you want to have a go at kind of trying to offer um, a rather more coherent answer to, my, uh, to the way that I framed the question? It is. It's, it's complex, isn't it? And I, I do think that we are constantly fighting against history and when I say history I'm thinking about you know how society has been developed and how women and women's needs have always been at the background I think about mental health I think about physical health I think about kind of criminal injustice you know it, we're not in a society where women are kind of treated equally and I think this power imbalance, the choices that men are making and, and the, the behaviours that we're seeing is kind of integral into in our, our society. It's coming from somewhere and, and we can make the argument of, you know, and I, I'm a trauma specialist, right? So I, I think about and, and, and work with childhood trauma kind of every single day. And there is this kind of notion of, well, you know, we need to support men in their healing processes because there's a lot of men that have been through a lot of um, kind of trauma in their developmental years but there's also the other aspect of these are choices that are being made and I'm not going to kind of your childhood doesn't excuse the choices that you make and then kind of within that I always like to think about the individual but the individual within the context of society and then the context of society if we look at kind of how women are upheld or not upheld within society how women are treated and then even the the kind of subsections and the intersectionality of being a woman and how different groups are kind of unfairly treated and harmed and, and the violence against women. And I think we can speak about violence against women through this dynamic, through rape, um, through kind of the, the direct violence, but through the systemic violence against women kind of across the board. And the thing about kind of experiencing trauma and experiencing this severe abuse and violence against your body you know, what helps heal people that have been through horrific trauma is how the people closest to them and society react to that trauma and how they support them through that trauma. But then if you have been through kind of one of the worst moments of your life, you go into a, a kind of a care system that doesn't care about you. You go into a justice system that doesn't care about you. Any type of justice it is kind of you know spread throughout time and then we're seeing very few women actually getting the justice that they deserve it perpetuates the trauma and this is why we we think about systemic harm and systemic violence because it's not just the direct violence it's the kind of what's going on in our systems what needs to change within our systems so we can again go back to the, the ultimate goal is a peaceful society a, a society where people are safe where they are actually safe and they have a perceived sense of safety. And I think when we start to think about things through this lens, we have to understand how detailed and complex these issues are, but also be working on every single level because that is the only way that we create the change. Thank you. Thank you, Whitney. Um, and, and Charlotte, I mean, you, you work within criminal defence. Um, what's your kind of sense of you know the kind of the state of play I mean you know because there's also the argument of course that defendants clearly have a right to a proper defense you know and, and an over focus on prosecution um, can be at the expense sometimes of obviously not least of all innocent people um, you know being being prosecuted so what's your kind of take on this argument that there is a, a fundamental failing in prosecution 
I don't think there is a fundamental failing in prosecution. Um, I don't think there's a fundamental failing um, in policing either. Not that I have seen. Um, for me, the, the low prosecution rates, it's just the nature of the beast. Sex ordinarily happens between two adults um, in the private sphere. So, so long as, so the, uh, the two types of cases really, you've got um, the one case where the defendant denies having sex with the woman at all, um, with the woman at all. And in those cases, prosecutions can be brought if there's evidence to demonstrate that they have in fact had sex because he then loses credibility and she will be believed by the jury that they um, had sex and it was non-consensual. And then there's the other type of case where the um, detainee at the police station says, no, we did have sex and it was consensual. So now the only question really is whether the sex was consensual or not, not whether they had sex at all. And only those two people know in, inside that room whether it was consensual. There might be evidence, for example, that she's uh, sustained some injuries, but then a natural um, rebut of that would be that they engaged in, in kind of heavy handed sex. Um, so when, you know, it's only those two people know the answer, is it really safe that all of these cases go before a jury because then we are risking miscarriages of justice at the same time? Um, and also, I don't agree with the movement that we've seen recently in that the police should automatically believe the victim. No, don't believe the victim. You can act like you believe the victim, so not to, you know, cause any distress to um, him or her, but don't automatically believe the victim because then you won't follow those reasonable lines of inquiries that my client needs. So when, I mean... In the last programme, um, in, in the February edition, we, we talked about the, you know, the conviction rate and broadly speaking from memory, it was like one or two percent of recorded rapes uh, end up with a conviction. So, you know, is that a sign of the justice system working properly? You know, it's only in those cases where there's very clear evidence and they secure a conviction, um, or is it a, is it a sign of justice failure? And I suppose I'm also mindful of, you know, what Whitney was saying there that you know the justice process itself is a very kind of punitive and alienating and punishing experience, including for victims in these situations. Uh, you know, so it's a very traumatic can be very traumatic for rape victims. So, you know, I mean, what's your thought on that very low? You know, I mean objectively low conviction rate. Is that kind of a sign of the justice system working? Um, yeah, for me, it's a sign that the, the justice system is working in those cases where um, I think the majority of rapes, or the vast majority of rapes, are where the two people know each other and there's, there's no, um, oh, I didn't have sex with her. It's no, we had sex, but it wasn't, um, it was consensual. And it's only probably in those, that 1% of rapes where it is a stranger rape. And in those cases, um, there'll be CCTV of the person being there, there'll be DNA evidence. In a case that I had, my client um, at the police station denied having sex with her at all, and his semen was found in her, in her vagina. So um, it was, at that point, he then pled guilty. Um, and I think it's in those cases that's why we see convictions there. I don't think it's I don't think it would be safe if only two people know if it was consensual to convict. How can that be beyond reasonable doubt? And I suppose what this is saying is that you know these specifics are kind of embedded with a wider you know kind of system of of, of misogyny and male violence and male entitlement, um, which brings us on to the final item in today's programme, um, should misogyny be treated as, as a hate crime? Uh, earlier this week, the House of Commons rejected the latest attempt to make misogyny a hate crime. It's an issue that's been very divisive. Um, some women's organisations, for example, the Fawcett Society, support the move. Uh, they argue that making misogyny a hate crime will mean that routine sexism that women experience could be recorded and at least in principle, therefore, could also be addressed. 
Others, such as Women's Place UK, oppose it. Um, they argue that it would be overly simplistic and an empty gesture. Um, and they've called for effective action to enforce the existing laws and to tackle the root causes of violence against women and girls. So very different perspectives within the kind of the women's movement more generally and reflected, no doubt, in uh, within wider society. Um, so, you know, what is it? Is, is making misogyny a hate crime, would it be an important step towards addressing male violence or is it a simplistic, empty gesture? Was the parliament right to reject calls to make misogyny a hate crime? Um, again, Winnie, let's start with you. Um, I mean, what do you, what do you think about this? I, I kind of find myself very torn, actually. I find myself very torn. And I think it's, it's, it's one of those things where it can be easily performance activism to to make it a hate crime because then you think if we think about everything we've spoken about today prisons not particularly working very well um police kind of already have too much on their hands and actually we've already kind of seen a lot of the the issues within the police so are, are they the ones that are supposed to uphold it is the criminal justice system supposed to uphold it if we know that with rape we're only seeing a one point kind of a one two percent conviction charge like What's going to make this any different? This is just more admin work for a lot of people if you want to be kind of real crude about it. And I think it kind of goes back to, you know, what are the systemic failings in the beginning? What generates kind of violence against women? What are the attitudes? What are the behaviours? And how do we as a society start to deal with these root causes? Because, you know, there are a lot of issues here and the, the, the violence is direct violence whether that's physical violence, kind of emotional, psychological violence, with like as in hate crimes, but then there's the systemic violence against women. And I think all of these intertwine with each other. And we always have to think about, you know, why are we doing this? What's the, what's the mean? Do we then want more men in prison? Is this how we're going to fill up those 4,000 kind of extra beds within the criminal justice system? A lot of it doesn't seem to make sense. A lot of it seems to be people thinking about things in, in kind of a fragmented way and not thinking about the whole and not thinking about kind of what is the, the, the kind of the truer needs of society in order to keep people safe and keep people kind of protected and having peace. And, you know, violence is expressed in so many different ways within our society, whether that's the violence against self, violence against other, whether that's the violence we see in relation to homicides, whether that's the violence we see in relation to, to rape. I think we need to really fundamentally understand that us as a society, and I mean the UK, I mean, you know, England, we have a problem with violence and we have a problem with violence on every single level, from direct violence to the political violence that we see across the globe. And until we're ready to really tackle violence and really think about the, the many different ways violence express itself, I don't think we're going to be going to get anywhere close to addressing the, the root causes of direct violence, especially violence against women, because we're seeing it systemically across the board and it's systemically across the globe. So for me, it's OK, if you if we did make it a hate crime, then what? So what? What happens? Very little, I think, would actually happen. And I think we need to start being more realistic with these things, because Again, this is this is what I kind of I feel is the, the performance activism. It, it's it's making surface level changes. But what's how does it change the life of of women or of people in the day to day because ideally we want to prevent things from happening in the first instance and I, I don't feel like this is around prevention this is around punishment after an incident that has happened and no and, and so picking up on just some of the practicalities i mean very specific practicalities and i mean going back to that question from earlier you know, are we concentrating on what people think rather than what people do and i guess you know if somebody is you know you know, attacks a woman motivated by misogyny, then it's it's clear that they've attacked the person. So you can focus on what they've done. Um, how you can police what's going on in their head is is maybe a kind of a slightly, uh, you know, more complex, uh, you know, set of questions. Um, I mean, we wish running out of time fairly soon on this item. Um, Roger, do you? I mean, what's what's what are your thoughts? I mean, hate crime, misogyny is a hate crime, yes or no? But you can be a bit more expensive than just yes or no if you like. I'm very doubtful of listening to to Whitney. Um, I'm 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 even more disinclined to to say that this is a a, a major answer. Um, 
I mean, what we're talking about are crimes, full stop. So deal with them as such. Um, and in a sense, it's really important to use the whole armory of law, um, you know, to 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 protect women, um, including civil measures and reports for so-called minor offences and, um, you know, kind of text text messaging, sort of, um, you know, sending porn, flashing and all that sort of stuff. You know, that's that's all part of it. Um, and I agree, really, that, you know, kind of longer jail time will just fill up the jails um, and leave people unchanged. Um, victims will will just will have longer to wait um, to worry about what might happen at the release date. And um, so um, and I endorse really that what we're looking at is fundamentals, um, differential gender power, um, if I can kind of use bit of jargon there um, and it is intersects with all the other uh, differentials uh, of power you know in terms of ability income rate racism and so on so um, I think what's what's what, what what can be a really important part of this is this discussion with men um, between men and women um, about power and and privilege and um, some of the ideas of kind of privilege and honour um, that, that, that men hold um, and, and kind of inflect almost like kind of daily responses. Um, and and, and that's, that's, that's a lot of work. Um, and, uh, you know, I, th I think it's part of, if you like, a kind of public health uh, approach so that all organisations... Um, should should be involved in, in 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 disseminating these messages and having these conversations and what's really important is that the police don't lead that's a, that's number one police thank you yes lead. let's not have the police leading on this one um well maybe we may all be able to agree on that um i'm going to come um charlotte in a minute to you for any thoughts you might have on whether misogyny should be a hate crime uh, but before doing so, there's some very interesting um, thoughts coming through on the Q&A. Um, one anonymous attendee, I agree with Whitney that creating more offences do not address the root causes. We have to decide what type of society we really want to live in. And there's, they have a more extended note there. You can have a look at You can see it on the Q&A. Um, someone else, another anonymous attendee, um, I think the current climate and narrative across societies in some instances encouraging skewed or distorted interpretations of sexual encounters and consent, uh, you know, kind of relating, I guess, to the previous item, but relevant for this one as well. And, um, and there's also this one, um, another anonymous attendee, interested in panel's views on the definition of misogyny that was proposed in the new love amendment. So this was a particular amendment that went through, went through, uh, through the um, House of Parliament. Does a definition based on gender rather than sex get to the root of male violence against women? And this was become another kind of, you know, significant area of contention that if you define it as gender based violence, then uh, that includes, uh, you know, those males who identify as women. And then you actually, you know, the argument would go, you're losing the specificity of male violence based on sex. Uh, you know, so kind of a very a sort of, you know, kind of complex and, and fraught area of debate in its own right. Um, before we um, before we conclude this item, though, um, Charlotte, I mean, I think there's probably two no's from um, from Whitney and from Roger in terms of misogyny and hate crime. I'm sort of broadly a no, but I kind of feel quite torn in some ways about the issue because I can see the arguments both ways. Um, not wanting to put you on the spot, but putting you on the spot, do you want to argue in favour of it being a hate crime? Are you, are you, would you um, agree with Roger? Um, my, my answer would be no as well. Uh, but I suppose one of the things we, we could think is, well, when I've had clients before and they've committed racially aggravated offences, it's down on their record as a racially aggravated offence. It's, it's certainly more relevant if they wanted to work um, in regulated, for a regulated body. Um, a bit like a dishonesty offence, you know, it's reprehensible behaviour if it was, if it's classed as a hate crime. Um, so yeah, it, it might have, it have a deterrent effect? Probably not. Uh, maybe it would cause society to think about it more if it was to become law, it would hit the press or misogyny is, makes it extra serious when you commit the underlying crime. 
we had the Me Too movement. That's generated a lot of um, public awareness to misogyny. So, no, um, I'm in the no camp. <laughs> well, there you go. We're finishing on a kind of a wild outbreak of agreement. I mean, you, you, I think, Charlie, you do pick up a, another important point, which is also about reporting and recording and what appears on people's records. And this has been a, a kind of a very sort of controversial area around some hate crimes where it's, you know, it's kind of up to dispute. And then what can happen is individuals effectively have a hate incident uh, recorded against their name because that's how it's perceived by somebody. Uh, which then follows them and they're thinking no I wasn't being hateful but now it's kind of on some record somewhere and it could affect my future employment so it goes back to that question of whether we're kind of as it were trying to police what people do or police in the loose sense of the term um, you know respond um, to what people do or respond to what people think or are perceived to think and uh, you know whenever the law gets into questions of perception um, or what seems to be, it can often be a very fraught and challenging area. I think it would be fair to say that there are people, including Charlotte, who are much better qualified to, um, to offer a view on that than I am. Um, that brings uh, today's proceedings uh, to a close. Uh, we uh, Sometimes these uh, programmes run through to about an hour and a half. We've been uh, kind of trying to squeeze them a bit because we're conscious that an investment of anybody's time, an hour and a half, is quite a big investment. So we are kind of trying to squeeze these events more towards being around an hour as long uh, to make them a bit more digestible and hopefully make them kind of feel uh, useful for those who attend. So um, our next last month in criminal justice will be on the Wednesday, the 6th of April. Uh, they're the first Wednesday of each month and uh, we'll be looking at developments during the course of March. If you enjoyed the programme, then, then do register for the April um, for the April event and indeed do tell others about it uh, as well. And um, our next um, our next programme that we'll be doing is on the 16th of March, where um, my colleague Helen Mills will be having lunch uh, with um, Gloria Morrison and Jan Cunliffe of Jengba uh, to discuss the long-standing and ongoing campaign against joint enterprise conviction. So if what Charlotte said today and what Whitney and others have said today about joint enterprises, if that's whetted your appetite, then please do register for that event. And of course, all of these programmes are will be on our YouTube channel in due course. So just leaves me to, to thank our three panellists today for giving us lots to chew over. For those who've attended, uh, including those, um, particularly those who donated when they registered and not too late to um, give us a donation now if you enjoyed this programme, but thank you those who donated when registered and thank you everybody who attended. I hope you enjoyed the event and found it useful and um, look forward to seeing you at one of our future programmes. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>